Hello everyone, my name is Eileen Zhou and I'm a manager with the International Public Sector Accounting Standards Board, the IPSASB. I'm here today with Ross Smith, the Program and Technical Director at the IPSASB, and we'd like to welcome you to this webinar and thank you for your interest in this topic. Today's webinar will provide an overview and results of the Public Sector Specific Financial Instruments Project. We'll first give a brief overview of the project on the objective, scope, and the timeline of the project. We'll summarize key accounting in the published amendments, highlight decisions made by the IPSASB in this project, the guidance in the final pronouncement, non-authoritative amendments to IPSAS 41, and finally summarize information about its application. Thanks, Eileen. We're excited to share this pronouncement given its relevance in the current climate. High quality financial information will continue to enhance government decision making as entities consider the use and issuance of monetary items to address challenges posed by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Completion of this project closes the IPSASB's work on developing guidance to address public sector specific financial instruments. And we'll cover that guidance being added to IPSAS 41 with this new publication. However, it's also important to highlight that the IPSASB financial instrument standards already include guidance designed for public sector transactions, specifically related to accounting for concessionary loans, valuing financial guarantees issued through non-exchange transactions, and equity instruments with a non-exchange component. Eileen, perhaps we can kick things off with a project overview. Absolutely. There has been a lot of work and inputs into this project since it began five years ago. The final pronouncement is a culmination of many considerations, countless discussions, and key decisions made by the IPSASB based on feedback from constituents, as well as inputs from members of its consultative advisory group, the CAG. The inception of the project stems from the IPSASB's previous project to develop IPSAS 28, 29, and 30 relating to the accounting of financial instruments. The IPSASB identified several items unique to the public sector that have characteristics which may make them public sector specific financial instruments or PSSFI. As a result, the board created a separate project to tackle four such items that are undertaken by monetary authorities, monetary gold, currency in circulation, IMF quota subscriptions, and special drawing rights. The objective of this separate project is to improve the relevance, faithful representation, and comparability of information about PSSFIs provided by a reporting entity in its financial statements. With this objective in mind, the IPSASB considered issues related to public sector specific financial instruments and approaches to recognizing and measuring these in financial statements. The board also considered and developed definitions that reflect the substance of these items, and the IPSASB intended for these definitions to have the su same substance as guidance that exists in the variant statistical accounting manuals. Overall, the detailed analysis published in the 2016 consultation paper concluded that with the exception of monetary gold, the other monetary items assessed in the project met the definition of a financial instrument defined in IPSAS 41 and that would be currency and circulation, quota subscriptions, and special drawing rights. We'll spend some time in the following slides to summarize how these conclusions were reached for each of the monetary items in scope of this project. Let's start with monetary gold. The IPSASB noted that monetary gold shares characteristics with financial assets, specifically cash. It is readily convertible to cash, easily tradable and divisible. It's globally quoted and accepted as a form of payment and is generally a store for wealth. Since monetary gold does not include or inherently include a contractual right to receive cash or another financial asset, monetary gold did not meet the definition of a financial instrument. However, it's clear that since monetary gold provides economic security and risk diversification, they could be held for similar purposes as other financial assets. In such cases, an entity can apply principles associated to financial assets to account for monetary gold. When monetary gold is not held for similar purposes as other financial assets, it's important for an entity to consider the facts and circumstances for holding this monetary gold. 
an entity will need to consider the hierarchy set out in IPSIS 3 accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates and errors to determine the most appropriate accounting under IPSIS based on those facts and circumstances. The next item is currency and circulation. In determining whether currency and circulation are financial instruments, the IPSASB considered the substance rather than legal form of physical currency, noting that in some cases, laws and regulations or similar requirements exist in jurisdictions which make obligations related to currency enforceable by law, for example, through a banking act. In such cases, these laws, regulations, or similar requirements, there is in substance a contract to deliver cash because there are two willing parties the entity which issued the currency and the holder of the currency that have agreed to the terms of the arrangement and the rights and obligation in that arrangement are enforceable. This satisfies the definition of a financial liability. IPSIS 41 therefore applies when the issuer has an obligation to exchange outstanding currency in circulation for new currency, which is enforceable by a banking act or other legislation. If there is no financial liability, the entity would consider whether an obligation is created in accordance with IPSAS 19 provisions, contingent liabilities and contingent assets. The third monetary item is IMF quota subscriptions. These items share some characteristics with equity as they're received when granted membership into the International Monetary Fund or IMF. And these quota subscriptions provide rights benefits and obligations associated with membership. The key determining factor though, is that members would receive its initial investment in return upon departure. This represents a contract to receive cash and as such meets the definition of a financial asset per Ipsos 41. The fourth monetary item covered in this project is special drawing rights. These are very technically complex instruments and are unique to certain entities. At a high level, SDRs are the currency of the IMF. SDR Holdings provides the holder with the guaranteed ability to access cash in exchange for SDRs. This represents a contract to receive cash, and as such, SDR Holdings meets the definition of a financial asset. The other side of the transaction are SDR allocations, which is an obligation to provide currency when called upon. This represents an obligation to deliver cash and as such meets the definition of a financial liability in the existing IPSIS guidance. Thanks for this summary, Eileen. As mentioned earlier in the webinar, all of the monetary items assessed in this project with the exception of monetary gold meet the definition of a financial instrument. That's right, Ross. Constituents' responses strongly supported the analysis and these accounting conclusions reached for the public sector specific items. Informed by this support, along with the input from KEG members, the EPSASB made a few key decisions that would frame how to achieve the project objective and develop useful guidance for the users. The key board decisions for this project are maintain the existing scope of the project, focus on areas where existing accounting guidance is insufficient, be pragmatic and succinct in developing any new guidance, and develop guidance in the context of IPSAS 41, where in scope of a financial instrument, rather than as a separate standard. Thanks, Eileen. One important point to highlight here is that these decisions were considered together as the project proceeded. Yeah, definitely. When the board considered the detailed analysis in the CP and the responses received, it was clear that the existing IPSAS 41 outlined clear accounting principles, and they were sufficient to help users classify, recognize, and measure financial instruments. The complexity in the accounting for these public sector specific items really stemmed from more of the scoping consideration, i.e. whether they are or are not in scope of a specific IPSAS. The IPSASB acknowledged that additional guidance in the context of IPSAS 41 would be helpful to identify when PSSFI meet the definition of a financial instrument and thus in scope of IPSAS 41 and help clarify existing accounting principles for users and how they would apply these to the monetary items. As a result, the IPSASB proposed additional and modifications to general and specific non-authoritative guidance for each monetary item to clarify whether these items meet the definition of financial instruments and thus in scope of IPSAS 41. 
The guidance was proposed in ED69, which was issued in August 2019. Yes, Eileen, and we received very strong support from stakeholders on ED69. Based on these constituent comments, the IPSASB incorporated additional basis for conclusions to clarify the key decisions, uh, which have now been issued in the final pronouncement, to assist users in applying existing IPSAS financial instruments principles to account for these types of instruments. Overall, these amendments serve to improve reporting related to financial instruments specific to the public sector and facilitate financial reporting that is relevant, comparable, and faithfully represents these important public sector transactions. This non-authoritative guidance will help entities determine when their monetary items are or share characteristics of financial instruments in the scope of IPSIS 41. The IPSIS B staff will also be issuing a staff Q&A in 2021 to provide additional guidance outside of the IPSIS literature to help users in applying IPSIS 41 to PSSFI. These non-authoritative amendments to IPSIS 41 are effective from January 1st, 2023. This effective date is consistent with the delayed effective date of IPSIS 41. The IPSASB recently published a pronouncement to delay the effective dates for a number of new standards that were not yet effective, including IPSAS 41, because of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to highlight that the standard does encourage early adoption, provided that IPSAS 41 is also adopted at the same time. Thank you for taking the time to join us today on this webinar. We hope you found it useful. For further information, visit us at www.ipsasb.org.